So um, the second and last talk of the session is Todd Martinez from Stanford. I was looking at your bio, and I saw you have lots of fellowships, which or you had. Um, we I once remember a paper written by three co-authors at MIT, and there were stars near the author names, and one of them said um, IEEE fellow, one of them said something else, Hertz postdoctoral fellow, and the third one said a jolly good fellow. And it was published that way. So here we're going to hear about uh, the use or the extent of which one can use learning uh, in chemistry. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to um, Rafi and the organizers for inviting me to come here. It's a pleasure to uh, celebrate the birthday of Israel. And, they, um, and, the, and the talk, you know, uh, Tishby's uh, talk was really a great setup, I think, for what I want to tell you. Um, they, so, so let's start by talking just about machine learning and big data, and in particular, these, these four words uh, get used together quite a bit, and there's a good reason for that. They're, of course, not the same thing. Um, big data is required in order to do machine learning, and machine learning is required in order to make any sense of big data. But they, um, but, but you get, and, and so they're almost inseparable. There's a good reason why we we talk about them together. Uh, but that leads you to sort of a question, and the question is how big is big? So what does big data mean? And here we can take a look at the uh, social types of uh, companies that actually build their business model on big data, and, um, and that will give us a sense of that. And the, uh, Google collects about three and a half billion pieces of information a day. Facebook stores 500 terabytes a day. Uh, even 10 to the 6 pieces of data is small, right? And, and I know this from talking to Google, right? So you talk to Google about any particular problem, they're like, oh, okay, so how much data do you have? And, they, um, and anything less than 10 million, they don't want to talk to you anymore, right? So they, and so this actually is, so in the context of trying to understand what we should be doing or should we be doing anything about machine learning in chemistry or with machine learning in chemistry, uh, we, we should take that as the sort of, um, as the yardstick to begin with. And we can then ask, you know, how many known molecules are there with molecular weight less than 500? That answer is only, it's a pretty large number, but it's only 65 million. There actually aren't really that many known, that's, that's not the number of, um, of um, excuse me, that they, well, that's right. That's the number of molecules we actually know, right, we've made over all of the course of human history. Um, the number of structures in the PDB is 125,000. Right, and so if you, what you really need to start doing is asking how are you going to get big chemical data, real big chemical data, and they, um, and I'll argue to you that the answer to that is really through simulation. Now, part of the reason that I'll argue to that to you is because they, um, is because if you look at the successes of machine learning over the last uh, few years, one of the first things that will probably come to your mind is um, is the uh, deep blue, right? So playing chess. The second thing that probably will come to your mind is Go. Right now, the reason why those things were so successful is precisely because you could have a computer that played against itself and that taught itself. And that's actually what we're going to need to be able to do. And so that's really the reason why um, being able to create uh, lots of simulation data is the key to getting the, the kind of data that you're going to be able to feed into machine learning. Additional molecular dynamics I'll tell you about in just a second, but essentially here you're going to have electronic wave functions, you're going to have nuclear coordinates, you're going to have energies. And, they, um, and so you'll have a lot of data, but the simulations are going to have to be very fast, right? If they're not fast, then we're not going to be able to um, we're not going to be able to generate data fast enough. So they um, so just a word about what first principles MD is. The idea is that we're going to solve for the um, we're going to solve the electronic structure problem in order to know where the electrons are. Uh, if we know that, we'll know electronic wave functions. From that, we'll be able to get um, the forces between the atoms, right, and we'll be able to solve Newton's equation or the Schrodinger equation, right, this, this construct uh, allows you to describe any chemical phenomenon you want, boundary arrangement, electron transfer, proton transfer, excited electronic states, and they, um, end at the same time, is also giving you information, not just about where the atoms are and how fast they're going, but also about what the electrons are doing at, any, at every given geometry, or at every geometry that's observed. So what we're going to, what, what the, the first, you know, what, what most of this talk is really going to be about is how do you actually take the, uh, that relationship between big data and machine learning. So what we need to do is get big data. Can we use machine learning ideas, that is the lessons that we've learned from machine learning, in order to 
uh, actually make simulations fast enough that we'll be able to get enough data to actually then start this whole loop. Right? And, they, um, and, and here I want to step back and tell you that the main idea really in machine learning, as far as I uh, understand it or the way that I think about machine learning, is that really all that it's about is discovering and exploiting sparse representations of data. Right, so you, and, and actually that is really echoes exactly what, um, what, what uh, Tishby was saying, uh, which is that the, the purpose of the neural net is, um, is to, the, that the forgetting phase would be important because that's actually what leads you to the sparse representation of the data. That's the only thing that really matters. And there are three forms of sparsity. You can argue that these are different, or you can argue that they're the same. But, they, uh, but historically, or, or oftentimes, people think of them as different things. The first is element sparsity. They could have many, many of your data elements are simply zero, and you should ignore them. They're not going to contribute to anything. The second thing you might think about is what we could call rank sparsity. The data elements are redundant. So many of them are exactly the same number, or uh, many of them are combinations of other sets. Right? They, um, that's, uh, as you said, you could think of element sparsity as a type of rank sparsity. Um, they, and the third, is, uh, is what I'll call model sparsity, that the data elements are redundant, but they're redundant because there's some underlying model which connects them to each other. Right? You could think, for example, a classical trajectory given a pot and, the, and the potential that generates it and the initial conditions are actually redundant. Because if you knew the potential and you knew the initial conditions, then you would know the classical trajectory for any period of time. Right? So, they, um, so those are the three kinds of sparsity that I want you to be thinking about as we talk about this. Um, I won't say much about element sparsity at all as we go along. It sounds very easy. Uh, it turns out that it's not so easy because you need to avoid logic. So if you're going to um, try to take advantage of the fact that you don't have to think about elements which are zero, then you have to make sure that you never think about the elements which are zero. You can't ask whether they're zero, right? So that's an organizational problem, but, but we won't, we'll, we'll assume that it's been solved, right? So, so the first, uh, the first uh, sort of uh, learning type of application you might think about is uh, recommendation systems. So you all should be, uh, I think if you, if you use computers, you, or uh, yeah, that's actually right. If you use the internet at all, so if you use computers or smartphone, uh, you're probably very familiar with the idea of a recommendation system. So the, um, the idea here is, uh, it, it's for example, um, well known in the context of uh, Netflix if you watch movies. So when you watch a movie, then it's automatically assumed that you must have at least partially liked it. And so you're allowed, they'll send you an email or let you go on their website and say that you really liked it or that you really hated it, right? And so you rate the movies by stars. And then the goal of the recommendation system is to suggest to you what you want to watch next, right? In the same way, um, the, um, the supermarkets like Target and uh, must be supermarkets in Israel too, uh, we'll keep track of what you buy, we'll give you a loyalty card to keep track of what you buy, and then they send you flyers that actually are tailored to you according to what you buy. Right? They, um, the most interesting uh, story about that from some time back was, the, uh, was that a, a father um, at home got a mailer from Target uh, for, that uh, was advertising baby clothes and cribs and cradles, and it was addressed to his 16-year-old daughter, and, they, um, and he was irate, and he called up Target and yelled at them and told them, what is your problem? Why are you sending this stuff to my 16-year-old daughter? And, they, um, and then called back six months later and said, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, apparently she was pregnant. Right? So they, um, and they, that's actually what that article is about. But so, they, so these things are stunningly accurate. And they, um, and they actually are being used ubiquitously. So what is a recommendation system? How does it work? Right? So they uh, said what it is. But let's think about it in the context of something like Netflix. So what you have is a, um, it's really just a big matrix, right? And the big matrix has, a, um, has one dimension, which is just movies, and another dimension, which is people. And they, uh, these are particular people, your friend Joe, your friend Fred, somebody Jane you don't know, whatever. And there are typically going to be millions and millions or tens of millions of these people, and there will be at least hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of movies. And, they, um, and what you can imagine is that unless, I mean, there are certain people that actually spend all their time rating movies, uh, but most people don't, right? So most of the entries will actually be blank, right? So you've never rented a movie from Netflix, or you, read, or you watched one movie, but you didn't rate it. Um, and, so they, um, and so there will be many, many question marks in this matrix, right? We can't even see how many question marks there are going to be, because I can only draw a small matrix so that you can see it. Uh, they, um, 
But there will be some numbers, right? So Joe watched Dark City and he didn't like it. He watched Zero Dark Thirty and didn't really like it very much. He watched Steel Magnolias, he didn't like it. Basically, he just doesn't like movies. Um, you know, Fred liked Dark City and Star Wars a lot, but he doesn't like these movies. And, they, and so what you have to do is you now have to complete the matrix. So I give you this matrix, which has a few numbers. I mean, this, in this case, you have about half the numbers. In the, um, in the true case, in Netflix, you have 0.1% of the numbers. Right? So you have this enormous matrix, you have a few numbers, and what I ask you to do is please tell me what's underneath all the question marks. Now, if you think about this problem for a few seconds, you will say um, you had 200 million unknowns, and you had a million numbers, and you want me to give you 199 million numbers back. Right? You say, I think that I have better things to do with my time. I could go to the beach, I could go drinking, I could do all kinds of things, right? Why would I try to solve your stupid problem, right? And that, in fact, is, the, is probably the correct response. But, but, when there's, but, but when there are billions of dollars on the line, then people start changing their minds. They think, well, maybe there is a solution after all, right? So if you tell me this, you try, uh, tell me, uh, uh, ask me to show that 2 plus 2 is 5, and you're, and, you're willing to, uh, and you're willing to give me a dollar for it, then I tell you, forget it. You're willing to give me $100 billion for it, and I tell you, I'll think about it, right? So, they, um, and, then, and in particular, how do you think about it? And this actually is, goes back to what I said machine learning was, or the way that I think about machine learning. Um, wait, the way you think about this is you say, is there, are there any set of circumstances under which this problem would be soluble, right? And if there were, then perhaps I could just assume that those circumstances held. Because if they don't hold, then it's not soluble and I'm wasting my time. But if they do hold, I get a billion dollars. Right? So they, and so this is what you, your next question should be. It should be, is this possible ever? And the answer is that it is possible if 199 million of those 200 million equations are, or variables, are redundant with the million. Right? And that really is a way of saying that if the matrix has no information in it at all, if the number of informative entries is a million, then I'm golden. So the machine learning strategy is assume that the problem is well posed and then solve it under that, under that set of circumstances. So what does it mean to say that the matrix doesn't have very much information? What it means is that if I did a singular value decomposition of the matrix, so if I took that matrix and I tried to write it as a sum of outer products, then, they, um, then what I would find is that the, and this is the sort of what you would find in a linear algebra textbook, right? If I try to do this, then what I would find is that, um, that, um, that many of these singular values would be zero, right? Because if they were zero, then it wouldn't, then the information content in the outer product vectors wouldn't matter, right? And so if I wanted to reconstruct all this matrix, if I wanted to reconstruct this entire matrix and it was all ones, then I would in fact only need a vector of ones here, a vector of ones here, and a number one here, multiply those together, you get all ones and you'd be done, right? So assume the rank is small. The rank is going to be the number of non-zero singular values and find the best low rank approximation that reproduces all the known entries in the matrix. So you have some set of, matri of entries you know, and then you try to solve this problem in a way that the, uh, that, the, um, that the rank is as low as possible according to the amount of information you have, and then reconstruct the rest of the, of the matrix. Now, that in fact is the way that those that, that recommendation systems are usually approached. There are various heuristics to make it fast, but, they, um, but that's the basic idea. And, they, um, and now we can, so we can take this back into electronic structure and ab initio molecular dynamics. And that's what the problem that we want to solve is the um, time-independent Schrodinger equation, that first problem that we needed to solve in order to know where the electrons were. The, um, one of the ways to solve that, the, the best way to solve that, is what's called full configuration interaction. So you write the wave function as a sum over all possible arrangements of n electrons, however many electrons you have, in m orbitals. And that's what I'm showing you here. So I have two orbitals. This is a simple case with two orbitals and two electrons. I can put the two electrons in the ground in the lowest orbital. I can put one electron in the lower, one in the upper. Do that same with the spins reversed, or put both of them in the upper orbital. And, they, um, and what you should notice here is that the number of these is going to be factorial in the number of electrons and the number of orbitals. So it's exponentially scaling, as Jury would say. They, um, but this will allow me to describe, if I know all these coefficients, it will allow me to describe any possible electronic wave function I want. It's an exact method. 
So, um, so as I said, I'm gonna, what, if I do that, I'm going to need then these uh, matrix vector products. I have to build the Hamiltonian matrix, the representation of the Hamiltonian operator in this basis. And I'm going to need to build these matrix vector products HC, the vector length being factorial at n and m. And so the uh, formal cost of this is the square of the size of that vector, uh, because I have a matrix times a vector, right? They, if, it turns out that this matrix, this Hamiltonian matrix H is pretty sparse. So if you take into account element sparsity, it's really about, um, it'll end up being about, the, the uh, cost will end up being of order n, where n is the size of that vector, which is exponential, right, or factorial. So can we use the, I, what we learned about recommendation systems to solve this problem? So it turns out that we can. We can take this vector, this really long vector, and I can rearrange it as a matrix. How do I do that? Well, I mean, in heuristically or, or schematically, all that I really need to do is take some uh, the square root of n elements and then put them over here, square root of n elements, put them here, right? So I just basically fold that into a matrix. In practice, that wouldn't be enough. You can't take any set of data and do that, right? In practice, what you notice is that those, uh, that those, um, those determinants, right, which are the many electron wave functions, are actually products of some part which is spin up, alpha, and some part which is spin down. So I can think of just the, um, of those pictures graphically, think of having one electron to spin up in the lower orbital, one electron to spin up in the upper orbital, and then direct product that with a set of two states, one where it's spin down in the lower and spin down in the upper. And if I take that direct product, I will regenerate, um, in fact, this entire basis set that I had before, right? And therefore, um, the, um, that, that tells me how to actually turn this into a matrix. Right, so I've taken a vector, I've turned it into a matrix, and then I say, oh, now I'm golden. Because I have a matrix, I know how to do singular value decomposition, I know how to play. If I had the singular value decomposed, that I'd be dead. Right, instead, what I'm going to do is assume that a singular value decomposition applies, and, then that the, um, and that there will be few terms in that, um, in that singular value decomposition that don't have zero singular values. So I'll write that. So here's this matrix. This is a sum over the rank of the matrix of a few non-zero singular values, which I don't know. I'm going to have to figure out what they are. And then outer products of these um, of vectors, which are a size square root of the original size. And, they, um, and then what that means is that the memory requirement and the computational cost is going to go as the square root of the original problem. Right? Now, I, I'll be honest with you and tell you that when we first figured this out, I was very depressed. Because I know that an exponential um, rises very quickly, and the square root of an exponential still rises very quickly. Right? Basically, it's still exponential. So, but it turns out that, the, uh, that that was, uh, that was uh, too pessimistic. Um, you also know that the uh, square root rises half as quickly, right? Or in other words, you can go to twice as large a problem, right? And so, the, um, and so that's what I'll show you here. But, but first you would say, is the, um, is the, what is the rank going to end up being? So is it going to end up being true that in fact there was no information in the wave function? Because remember, that's why the recommendation system idea worked, because there was no information there. So are electronic wave functions informative? And the answer is no, they're not. So this is looking at the uh, energy of the, um, the electronic energy as a function of the number of those product terms, or the rank, uh, for a uh, molecular anthracene. Right? It's looking, the blue is the singlet, uh, is the triplet, excuse me, and the, um, and the uh, red is the singlet. People have been interested in the singlet triplet gap in these molecules. And what you see is that 50 terms is enough to get below milliharpy, which is basically kilocalorie per mole or chemical accuracy. So this, uh, this energy gets to, the, you know, the, this is going eventually to the exact number, and they uh, it'll just converge to the exact number. But, they, uh, but it's already within chemical uh, precision uh, when you're done, then you have about 50 terms. 50 terms out of how many? Out of about 10 to the 7. Right? So there are 10 to the 7, the possible rank is 10 to the 7, and you need 50 to get chemical accuracy. They, if you look at energy differences, so we look at the gap between the singlet and the triplet, so that's, the, um, that's, that's a number that you could, uh, you could measure in an experiment, then you find that it's even faster. You only need about 10 terms to get the, to get the energy difference right. right? And the energy differences are the things that actually matter in most of chemistry, right? not the absolute energies. So, so now you say, well, okay, so is that actually, is it fast? Um, I mean, is, is it really tractable? Uh, they, um, and here I'll just show you the um, time that it takes on the computer to do this as a function of the number of determinants, the size of that space. This is, the, um, is uh, using a conventional full CI algorithm, scaling it. It's on a log-log plot. 
So you can see that the um, that this is uh, has a, a slope of uh, of one. So it's or, or two, it's the axis were right. So the um, so that the uh, this is scaling linearly with the number of determinants, which is what I promised you it would if the if we took advantage of the sparsity of the Hamiltonian. The by the time you get here to the largest one that I'm showing you, uh, you have ten to the ten determinants. Uh, so it's really hard to store this. So the limit here of the um, size of this uh, of this problem is actually limited by the um, by the ability to store the wave function, not so much really by the time. And you go and do this with this uh, rank reduced type of uh, approach, and what you see is that it scales now as a square root, which is what I promised you it would. And the um, and the and up here at 30 electrons and 30 orbitals, you were talking about uh, what is really I'm pretty sure the largest. Uh, full configuration interaction calculation ever performed is 10 to the 16 determinants. And I tried to understand what 10 to the 16 determinants meant, so I started looking around in the um, in the web to try to figure out, you know, how many what what kind of number could I compare to 10 to the 16? And it turns out that the number of grains of sand on the Earth is 10 to the 18. So this is within a factor of 100 of the number of grains of sand on the entire Earth. Now that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is linear. I mean, both of these are fit these lines pretty well. So you should be able to extrapolate and ask, well, how long would it take to do that calculation 30-30 if you actually could manage to store the wave function using a conventional technique? Uh, and the answer to that is, um, is that it would take 10 to the 15 seconds. So you go out here, you'll end up with 10 to the 15. All right, and then you say, well, what is 10 to the 15 in time? <coughs> really? Naftali took all my time. Yeah, it's exponentially growing. I know, yeah, I know. I have a problem here. Uh, the, the age of the universe is 10 to the 17 seconds. So this is within, within a factor of uh, 100 of the age of the universe that it would have taken to do that calculation. Now, are there methods like this applicable to larger molecules? Uh, the full, this, this full CI I told you about is exact, but you know, it's only up to about 30 electrons. It's still factorial scaling. So I mean, there was reason to be depressed. Um, other methods uh, scale as the fifth power of system size or worse. And so can we use these same ideas to make those more tractable? So the main problem is really computing contraction. So you have two electron integrals that are going to uh, that are going to actually describe repulsion of electrons from each other, that Coulomb repulsion, right? So you have two uh, wave functions multiplied to give you a charge distribution for, for electron one, charge distribution for electron two, and then divide by the, the Coulombic um, term. And so they so you have integrals like this, which just tell you whether how electrons repel each other, right? And now what you'll do in, in any uh, method in, in quantum chemistry, you're going to end up building contractions of these. So you'll take uh, density matrices, which basically are the wave function, and you'll sum them against these uh, against these integrals. Now the problem is that these in these integrals, the i, j, k, l indices are all coupled to each other, so you can't pull that integral apart. So the scaling is going to be at least n to the fourth for anything you do, and that's really where this n to the fifth comes from, right? So anything informative is going to be n to the fifth. So now you could treat those as a matrix and try to play the same trick. And just say, oh, OK, I can take the, those two electron integrals. I can treat them as a matrix. I can do some singular value decomposition. And everything will be fine. But before you do that, or before you think about doing that, I'll just remind you of what we know about dimensionality. Because this is really a four-dimensional tensor, right? some four-dimensional object. And if I treat it as a two-dimensional object, that's just like doing some kind of folding. Right, what I, if you look at this, you say, well, what, what, what is this a shadow of? So here's a shadow. It's a shadow of motorcycle, obviously. Well, no, it's actually a shadow of a bunch of junk metal. Right? So if you go look for shadow art in Google, you'll find that there are artists that spend their whole lives doing exactly this and just trying to mess around with your head and show you that dimensional reduction is generally a bad idea. Right? In this case, trying to show you sort of the opposite of what I'm trying to show you. So, all right, so, they, so can you instead apply these techniques directly to the fourth order tensor? And here I'll just show you the result. You can, you can take this fourth order tensor, you can write it in this form. And this form is, um, is, is a form that, uh, where every piece in it involves only two indices. And it turns out that those two indices are about the same range as the original set, so they're all about the same, uh, same range. So, they, um, so now this is actually going to end up scaling much better because I'm going to sum, if I want to sum over K and L, I can sum over K first and then I can sum over L and so forth, right? So the, um, so the I, J, K, L are unpinned. You can sum over any of those without carrying the others. And I will just tell you that there are numerical methods to determine these X and Z simultaneously. There are analytical formulas to determine Z given X. And there are numerical methods to determine X given Z. 
right? So you can actually solve this problem any way you want, either solve x and z, assert x, solve for z, or assert z and solve for x. And, they, um, and so we've done this, and the, uh, the result is that all methods that involve dynamic correlation, that involve electron correlation, um, are n to the fourth. And, they, and you achieve that scaling in all kinds of domains that actually no one was able to do really otherwise. Now, what's really happening here is that I told you a minute ago that the electronic wave function had no information. Now what I'm telling you is that the Coulomb operator has no information. So I'm telling you that the, so I told you wave functions don't have any information. I'll tell you the operators don't have any information. Next thing I'll tell you, nothing has any information. Just go home. Right? And actually, I would tell you that, except I don't think I'm going to get to it. Um, <laughs> but in any case, they... Uh, they so, so, the, so can you, is this accurate? The answer is yes, and you can start to do calculations on full proteins. You can do excited state calculations for uh, 300 atoms in a, in a protein. This is a QMM calculation, green fluorescent protein. Yeah, I don't have time to tell you about the, what that really is coming from. But, they, uh, but the point is that now you can do these, uh, these kinds of calculations where you're really going to start doing dynamics and do it with um, very accurate methods or, or quite you know, accurate enough methods to be able to describe the, um, the excited states and bond breaking. You're able to do that. And I guess I'm just going to have to skip over. Well, all right. I still have like two minutes? Yeah, yeah barely, huh? Okay. So, um, so, the, so, so now you can actually say, all right, if you have evidence for MD, can you start exploring this? Can you start generating big data? And you know, what we showed is that you can. You can take a, a bunch of molecules. You can stick them in a, um, in, uh, in, in, a, um, in a sphere. You can heat that up, and you can actually start watching them react. Right? And so what you're really trying to do is solve this problem, which is that the chemical landscape involves many minima, which involve different molecules. And what you want to do is understand in chemistry, what you want is to understand how long does it take to go from one to another, or is there a pathway to go from one to another. The problem with this kind of picture is that there are many, many molecules, right? So there's many species, and do you really need to consider all of them? They, um, and if there are, for each of those species, the number of, if you have n species, you're going to have in principle n squared paths, right? And so finding all these paths is going to be very problematic. The traditional approach to this has been to get a graduate student, one of these hikers, so you go and you get a graduate student, you tell them to start off here and end up over here, and then five years later they finish. And they get another grad student, tell them to start here and end up over here, and five years later he finishes, and so forth and so on. And eventually, if you have enough grad students over enough time, you've mapped out enough of this that you have a set of, of kinetic equations, you can actually describe a set of reactions. What we decided we wanted to do is said, well, look, if you can do this fast enough, then you can, um, you can actually just do this by brute force. So you can do, uh, have, solve the electronic Schrodinger equations, solve Newton's equations, run this forward in time, and you can see that molecules, that chemistry is starting to happen. So this started out with all acetylene and hydrogen, and now you have uh, something which is uh, ethane, ethylidine, right? And so molecules can be made. They, um, you can then say, well, if I have molecules being made, then I have sequences of reactions. You can use that to, and this is what this is showing us, is what the computer can actually start figuring out uh, what you actually have at given points in time. And then the... And then, they, and then you can actually start to uh, put that into, so this I'll just have to skip over. You're going to have to go into, um, you can put this into, uh, into pathways that go from a barrier, uh, or excuse me, a minimum over a barrier to an intermediate, or from a minimum over a barrier to another minimum. You'll have dynamic pathways that actually did that, so where the reaction was observed. And then you use transition state theory, or RKM, from... Um, uh, Rudy to actually get the rates for those. You can put that into kinetic models, and the um, and that really gets you um, forward in time. Now, what I what I want to so I don't have time to do that, but what I want to do is now just say what happens really in the future, right? So Rafi asked me to say something about where all this goes, and and what I want to see, or what, what I didn't get to tell you enough about in the last part is that, in fact, you can start generating lots and lots of data. So you have lots and lots of chemical reactions where, and mechanisms for those reactions which are generated through this. How do you determine which of these interactions are interesting? Um, how do you actually bias the nanoreactor? This, if you're going to start, if you can generate lots of chemical reactions, how do you actually bias it to find the reactions you're interested in? Right? And, and how do you connect that ultimately with synthesis planning? And this is the sort of idea that we have, uh, that you would um, have a... Um, nanoreactor simulations that are discovering chemistry, 
you have a reaction graph of all the, all the reactions you've already discovered, and then you use machine learning techniques to uh, try to devise from this graph a synthetic route that goes from one molecule to another. And, they, um, and then, uh, if you can't get from, from, the, from the point you want to the, to the final molecules, then you would try to figure out, well, what kind of reactions do I have to discover? And that's sort of the, um, the basic idea. So the last thing I'll say is that, they, um, that all of this is really based on the concept of a dictionary that you can scan. Right? So the, in the case of SVD, you're scanning over vectors. Right? So you have a dictionary of vectors, and you're scanning over those to find a sparse set. They, can you go beyond this? And actually, that's sort of what we were doing in the context of the Coulomb operator, although I didn't really show it to you that way. Can you go beyond this and actually scan over theories? And that's really the sort of model selection. So can I say, well, look, if I did a bunch of, di this is actually uh, very much along the lines of what Rudy was uh, musing about a couple of days ago, which is uh, what Dorit talked about uh, or alluded to with respect to uh, knowledge and, and understanding, right? So how is it that I can take all of the data that a simulation gives me and then actually reduce that? I mean, I showed you very quickly, you can start reducing it to be a transition state theory, and that's to be a particular model. But can I actually have the machine start figuring out what model? Right? Should I be using Marcus theory with some selection of collective coordinates? What kind of collective coordinates should I use? If I'm going to use Langevin dynamics to describe this, what, is the, what are the key active coordinates? What, is this, what are the characteristics of the bath? How do I actually get the computer to report to me both quantitative results and cartoon models with confidence limits? So the computer actually needs to be doing automated hypothesis generation and testing and then trying to tell me this is the cartoon model, the simplified physical model that you should be using, and this is what I think is really probably the, the most important part that I wanted to get across, which is that you know, what, what the role of simple theory in physical chemistry is not less today because of computing. It's actually far, far more, because the only way we're going to understand the computer simulations that we do is if we, under, if we have simplified theories and if we have the computers doing that. So, so I'll stop by saying machines should learn, but we should too. And that's really, the, I think, my, my main uh, conclusion. Sorry. For... Maybe uh, one or two short questions, or questions with short answers over there. Uh, So how does uh, reduced rank full CI compare to stochastic or quantum Monte Carlo full CI? Uh, so the main comparison is that it is, um, that it is uh, far faster about, well, I, the calculations I showed you are done on a desktop. So the 3030 was done in, um, in an hour. Um, and that, so uh, you'd have to ask Someone that does FCI QMC, how long it would take, but I'm sure that the, the um, speed up is at least a thousand, and they um, and and that there's no noise in the in the result, so the result exact is exact instead of having noise, but otherwise it's the same. The, there is how there's something I should point out, which is that there's a there's a pretty hard wall here, at around um, 30 electrons or so. So with full CI QMC, you can go our stochastic method. You can go beyond that. Right, but but be but at the level, if you can do it that way, you you there's not much reason. Yes. Hey, Todd, I enjoy your talk. Uh, Thank you. The uh, second bullet of your summary page, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I missed studio, but I just want to. Uh, I mean, my uh, mm -hmm. my impression is uh, the simulation cannot generate a marker theory or Langevin equation. No, no, yeah. that's, no, 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 okay, so no, so what I was trying to say, so, so if you think in terms of compressed sensing, well, okay, so if you think, everything that I was saying about machine learning, I told you it was trying to discover sparse representations. The way it discovers sparse representations, I could talk about why that's true offline, um, even for SVD, but the way it discovers sparse representations is that you give it a dictionary of things, and you say, here's a bunch of things that could be, uh, that I consider to be sparse. For example, in a, for a function, you would, give it, um, you would give it delta functions and say, I consider sparse functions in real space to be sums of few delta functions. Or in frequency space, you would say, I consider things that are sparse in frequency space to be sums of few Fourier components. But you give it a dictionary. 
Right? So you gave it a dictionary. Now, can you actually flip that and say, or go to the next level of, of, of complication and say, let me actually give it dictionary as dictionary items, not um, functions, but whole theories, time-dependent functions, right? Things which are highly parameterized, say, a Lamarckus model. So that gets fed in. Of course, it has some parameters that the machine would have to learn. And the machine would learn those parameters, and then it would say, this satisfies, Mar this basically is described by Marcus theory with these parameters. Right? Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I got it. it. It is a machine learning of large data sets that help you to distinguish which one of these dynamic yeah. models, Marcus theory, laundry equation, or stati right. other statistical right. models that fits right. the, provides the better uh, description. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, and still, thank you.